Hello, my name is Micah Watson and I'm a composer and music producer. Welcome to the Mastering Ableton Live series, Lesson 2. Today we're going to be looking at Chapter 4, but because Chapter 4 is fairly lengthy and also really important, we're going to be breaking up this chapter into four separate videos. I also recommend that you watch my previous video, The Difference Between Audio and MIDI, just so that we're on the same page. So let's get started. For this tutorial, I'm going to be using a demo track that comes with Ableton Live when you purchase it. These demo tracks are hidden quite well, so I'm going to show you how to access it. In your Finder, head on over to your Macintosh device. Go to Applications and find Ableton Live 9 Suite. Right click on it, Show Package Contents. Contents, App Resources, Core Library, Lessons, Sets, and here you've got a whole host of Ableton Live sets that you can use and play around with to help you with your learning process. For this tutorial, I'm going to be using APC 40 Demo. In order to keep the demo as it is, I'm going to save a copy of this onto my desktop with another name. I don't recommend you just save things to the desktop all the time. Do as I say, not as I do. Alright, so for the first installment of Chapter 4, we're going to be looking at some Ableton Live concepts. It's important to note that what we will be talking about are things on a conceptual level. Therefore, it's really, really important to understand these things because a solid understanding of the program's basic principles will help you fully exploit Live's potential for your music making. So let's have a closer look at the browser. This box on the left here is your browser. This is the place where you interact with your library of musical assets. This is where you'll find the core library of the sounds that are installed with the program and any additional sounds you've installed either via the Ableton packs, presets, samples you've saved, or any other third-party devices. Live sets live in a live project. A live project is a folder that collects all the related materials for your live set, and this can also be opened through the file menu's open command or through the Lives browser. In Ableton Live, you have two ways of viewing your music. This is where things get really interesting, because in my experience, this is what sets Ableton Live apart from other DAWs, at least the ones that I've used. You can either view it through the session view, as is the default view when you open Ableton Live, or you can hit tab on your keyboard and head on over to the arrangement view. Hitting tab on a single screen will toggle between the two windows, and if you've got more than one screen, hitting tab will change which view is on your active window. Another way to toggle view between session and arrangement is to take your mouse on the right of your screen and toggle between the vertical and horizontal lines. The basic musical building blocks of Live are called clips. A clip is a piece of musical material. It could be a melody or a drum pattern, a bass line or even a complete song. Live allows you to record these clips and also to alter clips. And through these clips, you're able to create larger musical structures from them. Things like songs, remixes, even DJ sets or stage shows. The session view holds clips in a very particular way. And the arrangement view holds them in a different way. As you can see right now, I don't have any clips in my arrangement view at all. I haven't added any clips yet to the arrangement view. We'll get to that in a moment. But for now, let's have a look at the clips that you find in your session view. Each clip has its own play button and various stop buttons in and around the live window. By hitting the play, you can launch the clip. You can change the way these clips are launched by double clicking on the clip and moving your mouse to the clip window. At the bottom left, you'll see a little L. When you hit the L, you are showing the launch box. This launch box is where you change the controls on how your clips are triggered. But in this video, we're just talking about concepts, so I'm not going to get into detail on that just yet. So when you're in the session view, you're able to use these clips kind of like a launching base and just have fun with the music. When you're just playing around like that, it's purely spontaneous and none of the work is being recorded. But if you actually want to record your jam session, you're able to do so. And that's when the arrangement view really starts working well with the session view. Toggling between the views simply changes the appearance of the live set and it doesn't switch the mode. It doesn't change what you hear or change what is stored. But when you want to record your improvisation, you're able to record a copy of what you're doing into the arrangement view and then edit it later. 
Once you're done recording, hit tab. You'll see in the arrangement view that you've now got some data stored, which wasn't there previously. The reason that you can record things from the session view into the arrangement view is that they're connected via tracks. They host clips and also manage the flow of signals, as well as the creation of new clips through recording, sound synthesis, effects processing, and mixing. In session view, the tracks are vertical columns. However, in the arrangement view, the tracks are horizontal rows. In the arrangement view, the musical data is played from left to right. This brings me to a really, really important rule. A track can only play one clip at a time. In this track, I can't play two drum samples at the same time. That's why in a track, it's best to organize clips that you would play in succession and not clips that you want superimposed. In the way that this live session is set up, I'll never be able to play drums A and drums B at the same time. But of course, this doesn't mean that you can't play drums B and warm EPB at the same time. Therefore, one usually puts clips that should play alternatively in the same session view column, and you would usually spread out clips that should play together across tracks in rows. We call these rows of clips that should play at the same time scenes. Now, before you get worried and really like drums and you think, but I really want to play two drum samples at the same time. That's not a problem, we just need to create a new track that hosts clips that can be launched in succession. The way I've set it up now, I can play drums A and drums B at the same time. But this rule of only being able to play one clip at a time on each track extends further. At any one time, a track can either be playing in the session clip or in an arrangement clip, but never both. This is where it's important to understand live's hierarchy in which one wins when you're trying to play both. When a session clip is launched, the arrangement track will stop whatever it is doing to play that clip. In particular, if the track was playing an arrangement clip, it will stop in favor of the session clip. The track will not resume arrangement playback until explicitly told to do so. And you do that by hitting the back to arrangement button. This button only appears if you're busy playing a session clip. This little orange button disappears if you're actually playing arrangement clips. Therefore, you can't actually hit the back to arrangement button because you're already in the arrangement setting. But now that I'm going to launch a clip, remember that the hierarchy will say that it'll stop doing the arrangement playback and favor the session clip playback. Once I've launched that clip, you can see that the orange button comes back. Another great feature is that each track has its own back to arrangement button, which allows you to resume arrangement playback for only certain tracks. This drums track doesn't have a back to arrangement button because it's already activated in the arrangement view because I haven't launched any session clips. But as soon as I launch a session clip, it'll also get its own back to arrangement button. You can always alter the arrangement again by activating the arrangement record button disengaging record mode by hitting the record button again or stopping live using the stop button leaves us with an altered arrangement. You'll probably notice that some of these tracks look a bit different. The bass has squiggly lines whereby the drums have straight lines. What's more is that I double click the drums I get this MIDI editor and if I double click this bass I get waveforms. This is because the bass track is an audio track and the drum track is a MIDI track. Audio signals are recorded and played back using audio tracks, and MIDI signals are recorded and played back using MIDI tracks. The two track types have their own corresponding clip types, and audio clips cannot live on MIDI tracks and vice versa. To insert a new MIDI clip, you head on over to your track, right click, and insert MIDI clip. You'll see the MIDI editor, and by hitting B on your keyboard, you'll get a pin where you can quickly insert notes. If you're not hearing a sound, it's probably one of two things. A. Always make sure that a MIDI track has an instrument. And also, when you're busy editing your MIDI and you're not hearing anything, toggle on over to this little button with a little headphone icon on it. This is the MIDI editor preview button. If it's blue, it's active and you should be hearing back what you're editing in the MIDI window. And if it blends in with your Ableton skin, you won't hear the alterations that you're busy making. Heading on over to an audio track, 
An audio clip contains a reference to a sample, also known as a sound file or an audio file. This clip tells Live where on the computer's drive to find the sample and what part of the sample to play, as well as how to play it. When you drag in a sample, Live automatically creates a clip to play that sample. It can get pretty tedious to drag a sample and then test it. And that's where preview mode is fantastic. Head on over to the headphone button at the bottom of your browser and make sure it's activated. When it's activated, you can preview the clip simply by clicking on it. And because these clips are just a reference to an audio file and not actually an audio file itself, you can create an abundance of new sounds without actually changing the original sample. What this means is that you can give Ableton Live tons of instructions on what to do with the sample it's accessing. It won't actually change the sample, but the sound that you'll be hearing will be completely different. All these changes are computed in real time while the sample is played, and all these settings you can access on Clip View by double clicking the clip. You can also warp clips. Warping means changing the speed of sample playback independently from the pitch so that your clip matches the song tempo. The tempo can be adjusted on the fly in the control bar's tempo field. You can click and hold and move your mouse up and down, or you can simply input a new value on your keyboard. Another great use of the warping technique is synchronizing sample loops to the chosen tempo. Live's auto warp algorithm actually makes it easy to line up any sample with the song tempo, such as an old recording of you playing violin or singing a melody that just was a little bit offbeat. You can also use warp to dramatically change the sound of a sample. But before I get distracted with audio sound design, let's talk about the MIDI clips and MIDI files. MIDI clips have the extension .mid and a very particular icon. As said before, you can access the clip's MIDI view by double-clicking on the MIDI clip. There are also some really cool MIDI effects that you can use. This is where we start looking at the device view. Double-clicking on a track's title bar, like this warm EP or short bright, will bring up the device view. The device view shows the track's device chain. A device chain is a chain of audio effects that are connected to each other via a virtual stereo cable. By chaining effects, you're able to completely alter the sound of your audio clip. And the same applies for MIDI. There's some really great MIDI effects and I'll show you one shortly. There are so many devices that you can use that you get from Ableton Live. And you can also use your third-party plugins which you can't see on my machine yet because I haven't set it up in the preferences yet. Don't worry too much about third-party plugins, especially if you're new to this. Ableton Live has tons of native effects that you can use to get going and create some really cool music. You can take these effects and drag them into the device view and build up your own chain of effects. Let's consider an audio clip playing in an audio track. The audio signal from the clip reaches the leftmost device in the chain. This device processes and changes the signal and feeds the results into the next device, and so on. Theoretically, the number of devices is infinite, and the only real limit imposed on you on the number of devices you can use at the same time is your computer's processing speed. There are all sorts of things you can do to write music that is inexpensive on your computer processor, a topic where there is much to learn about. Note that these connections between these devices are always stereo, but the actual software's inputs and outputs, like your microphone and your speakers, can be configured to be mono in the audio preferences. Once the signal has passed through the device chain, it ends up in Live's mixer. The mixer can be shown in both views for convenience. To optimize the screen layout, the individual mixer sections can be shown or hidden using the view's menu entries. And if you haven't been able to see your mixer, then click on view in your title bar and make sure it's checked. Unchecking it will remove it. Each mixer has a volume tab, a pan tab, and a send tab if you have a return track. As soon as I've added this return track, you can see that I've got the send over here, and in the arrangement view, the send is this little box over there. The main mixer can also have a crossfader tab. You can access this by heading onto the title bar, hitting view, and checking crossfader. This crossfader can create smooth transitions between clips playing on different tracks. Live's crossfader works like a typical DJ mixer crossfader, except that it allows crossfading not only to, but any number of tracks, including returns. 
Devices that receive and deliver audio signals are called audio effects. Audio effects are the only type of device that fit in an audio track or a return track. For MIDI tracks, we have MIDI effects as well as MIDI instruments. Consider a MIDI track playing a clip. The MIDI signal from the clip is fed into the track's device chain. There it is first processed by any number of MIDI effects. A very popular MIDI effect is an arpeggiator. That's without the arpeggiator. And with the arpeggiator. After the MIDI is processed by these MIDI effects, the signal will be fed into an instrument. These MIDI instruments receive MIDI and deliver audio. After the instrument, i.e. after the MIDI signal has been converted to audio, there can be any number of audio effects, just like in an audio track. If a MIDI track doesn't have an instrument, then the track's output is just a plain MIDI signal, which obviously has to be sent somewhere else to be converted to audio. In this case, the track's mix and send controls disappear from the mixer. Every live device can store and retrieve particular sets of parameter values as presets. You can either purchase presets, download them online from people that are sharing their own, or you can make your own. To build up your user library of presets, head on over to the Save button on a device whose preset you've changed and liked. Upon clicking it, a new file appears which you can name. I suggest you have a good structure where you can keep all your presets so that you can easily find them when you need them. Hitting Escape cancels the save. You can also save different combinations of devices and their setting as a single preset. This means that you could load a whole drum or effects rack. This feature allows for the creation of powerful multi-device creations and effectively adds all the capabilities of Live's MIDI and audio effects to the built-in instruments. And finally, the last concept I want to talk to you about in this tutorial is routing. As we've seen, all tracks deliver signals, either audio or MIDI. We know how these signals flow, but where do these signals actually go? This is set up in the mixer's in-out section, which offers for every track chooses to select a signal source and a destination. Typically your destination would be your headphones or your speakers, but more complex scenarios also exist where you want to send the signal somewhere else before it hits your speakers. When this in-out section is activated, you might not see a difference. Move your windows along until you're able to see the new in-out section in your mixer. This in-out section is Live's so-called patch bay. The various routing options available to us through this enable valuable creative and technical methods such as resampling, submixing, layering of synths, complex effects, setups and much more. Signals can be sent to the outside world via the computer's audio and MIDI interface, to other programs that are connected to Live via Rewire, and it's even possible to route signals to external hardware devices from within a track's device chain by using the external audio effect and external instrument devices. Just note that these devices are not available in a light or intro edition, so I won't go into them right now. Rewire is a software protocol that enables different audio workstations to communicate with each other. It would, for instance, allow me to access a Reason instrument while I'm working in Ableton Live. I can assure you that by knowing these concepts, it'll dramatically improve your ability to learn and use Ableton Live. There were a lot of things that I just mentioned the names of, and don't worry, I will get into more detail. But for now, I just wanted to show you where things are, what they do, and the basics of how the DAW works. The next three videos that will comprise this four video series of chapter four will include topics like recording new clips, recording automation, and saving and exporting your work. Thanks for watching and have fun.